Hello, everybody, and welcome to the HTML All the Things podcast, episode 82, Web Design Stats 2020. I wanted to do like a, I get like the air horn out, 2020. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, 2020 hasn't been great. So anyway, uh, it's been great for us, but it hasn't been great for the world, I guess. Anyway, uh, I'm your host, Matt Lawrence, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Mike Coran. If you've been enjoying the podcast so far and you want to support us, there's a couple ways you could do that. You could review us on Apple Podcasts or on the podcast platform that you're listening to this on. You can also check us out on that Patreon. only got a couple of tiers, but... That $3 tier will give you a shout out on the show and we will share a link to your website in our show notes. And the most important one is you just tell your friends that we're here and we're ready to be listened to. So share us, let everybody know, hey, look, these guys are here and they have a show. But anyway, uh, <laughs> oh, I uh, sabotaged, I'm laughing here because I sabotaged part of Mike's uh, show notes while he was in the bathroom that he just noticed. <laughs> But probably the most important... Oh, I already read that one. Oh, now I'm just touch myself. Anyway, uh, come uh, hang out with us if you want to go a step further than uh, just sharing. And uh, you and your friends can come hang out in our Discord server. We've got a lot of members in there now. Like I think it might be 400, something like that. Anyway, we've got a lot of members in there. So come join us. Come join the chats. And we'll be talking about programming and video games and movies and all kinds of other stuff. So come join us for some of that. Now, before I want to go... Before we get into our weekly pain point, I just wanted to preface this with a bit of an update... So our our Twitter poll. So I forgot to do last week's Twitter poll, the one that we mentioned in episode eighty one. I'm gonna do that this week. Whatever, like so big deal. Uh, but the other Twitter poll, uh, the uh, the one about Office Space from a couple of weeks ago, those results are in because they were it was still pending upon the last episode's recording. So I just want to go through this. Now there's a small discrepancy. I want to state this on the tweet itself. <laughs> right now it says that I have twenty six votes, but when I go into the actual analytics. It says I have 19 votes. So I assume the 26 is correct because it's public facing. So I'm going to go with that number, but I just wanted to say that. Anyway, uh, so our Twitter poll a couple weeks ago, starting on February 13th, was what type of office do you prefer? And uh, we had a couple of options here, four options. We had traditional, so for example, cubicles, open concept, uh, remote, for example, from home, and a co-working space. So... Starting at the top there, traditionals, uh, i.e. cubicles, 3.8% of the votes. Uh, Open concept, equal with that. So open concept, 3.8% of the votes. Remote, so for example, from home, 69.2% of the votes. And a co-working space uh, coming in hotter than the first two, but not as good as the uh, remote, at 23.1% of the votes. So remote's obviously the big boy there, uh, but... Interestingly, and uh, if not to do a little self-plug for our Discord again, we had a pretty good conversation actually in our Discord about how some people were saying that, um, you know, it's, it, there's benefits actually to being in an office. Like some some really good points were actually brought up about how if you don't know what you're doing, that team environment can help you. Um, I'm just paraphrasing from a conversation a couple weeks ago now or a week ago. And basically how once you know what you're doing, then remote might seem really great, but Some people need to get up and go to that office, and some people also just need that team environment constantly, whether it be for the social or the professional, like, hey, I need help with this, or hey, let's collaborate constantly, Um, because collaboration can be faster in an office. So that's just, that's a little tidbit. So yeah, that was a pretty successful poll. We're going to be, I don't know, probably try to do these every now and then now. So I'm going to have this other, have the, the other one from episode 81 up, and that one is, I'm paraphrasing, I gotta word it, it is the, I forgot what it was, Mike, what was it? It was the, come on, Mike, now he's the searching, wor- I can working, see him. The working too hard one. Oh, right, so it's like, I'm paraphrasing it, but it's gonna be, you know, should you have an e- equal work-life balance when you're starting, should you be working a bunch, should you be working a bunch throughout your career, should you be working, like, a healthy amount throughout, should you have less hours later, like, whatever, I'm gonna, you know, word this, because I have limited options on Twitter, limited space, so I'm gonna word that, post that up there, so uh, keep an eye on our Twitter, that's at HTML everything, but as we assumed, remote work from the last poll won. Anyway, uh, another, a very brief announcement, but we won't unveil too much, Mike and I got our first round of stickers, so we got our first concept, we're not ready to unveil them yet. But we got our first concept taster done up stickers. Uh, They're we're so really good. Yeah, They're so good. So we're we're really digging them for sure, hundred percent. And so we're looking to 
go further than just a sampler now. And so just an FYI to everyone out there, just so you guys know that we are, in fact, working on that, as we did mention it a few weeks ago now, probably about a month or so ago. So that's still in the works. It's being worked on. Um, and right, like alongside it, right after this this tax season, because it's tax season here in Canada, after this tax season, we're going to hit the uh, hit the HTML, all the things website hard. It's just I want to get my taxes done. Or I need to get my taxes done. <laughs> Everyone does. So uh, anyway, so that's just a bit of an update from us. And now, without further ado, Mike, weekly pain point. I feel like we just discussed the weekly pain points right there. Quizzes, taxis, and all that. I feel like let's move right on to the episode. You don't want me. Um, to, you don't want to talk. You don't want me to talk about my. You call me a, a diva or something? Would you call me? Yeah, I did. You I call did me give a you fucking a, diva or something. A diva. If you want to give a quick one, but my weekly pain point is so weak that I don't even want to do it. So if you want to give a quick... Mike's weekly uh, pain point is he's driving around, apparently. That's what yeah, he has. Apparently, he's apparently driving is, is a pain point. I That's too much complaining. No, no. I'm looking at you. It. Looking at you with my uh, horseshoe mustache. Just looking at you. Stroking it, even. Stroking my mustache, to be clear. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so my weekly pain point, and this is sort of like an update. Like, it's an update for me, personally. Like, I'm, I'm touching my chest with my hands here right now. This is a This is a point that's that's... That's true to my true to my heart. It's wireless charging. Now, hang on. It's not a complaint. <clears throat> I have a Note 10 Plus, okay? And so it has the wireless power share function where I can share the power to like something like Galaxy Buds. So I can charge my Galaxy Buds off of my phone. And then, of course, the phone itself can charge off of wireless charger. I have a wireless charger that I received for Christmas. And so that's fine. What I've been thinking of doing, though, is I'd kind of like to just not plug my phone in again. Um, this is sort of a part of my UX improvement. I mentioned this on the show briefly a few times, how this year I'm trying to make everything super efficient. And so, so right now I have an OtterBox on my Note 10 Plus and it's really bulky. Now for a short time I had a slim case and I really liked it, but it was a slim case and I just got a little paranoid. But I really like the idea of having a slim case. This is a heavy phone with this OtterBox on and the OtterBox is great. Like it's a freaking good OtterBox, but I just kind of want something a bit slimmer because I'm not in a construction zone or anything. And so I bought a gel case, a slim case that's, that's, you know, easily compatible with a lot of wireless chargers. And now hang on a minute. I know you're about to say this, this otter box is wireless charger compatible. Correct. However, I actually have one of those metallic plates for a ma- magnetic car mount on the back, which makes it incompatible. Okay. So the otter box is compatible. This one, because of the, because I stuck a metallic plate on the back is not. So what I was thinking was, well, I'll reduce the weight. I'll reduce the bulk. I'll get a nice, just real plain gel case. I won't have a plate or a ring because this is like a metallic plate with like a ring that pops out. I won't have like a little support ring on there anymore. And what I'll do is I'll get a gravity car mount that attaches to the vent because I also switch cars every now and then. And what ends up happening is I can't take my current magnetic mount with me because it comes off the window. Now, of course, I could unsuction it, but like that suction cup will get old and useless as I keep removing and and applying it. So I don't want to just do that. So I thought, okay, I'll get a vent one because then I just, you know, undo the clip and do whatever. And this is a wireless gravity charger. So what it is, it's a wireless charger and it's one of those gravity ones where you drop the phone in and the arms come in and cradle it. So this is now what's going to happen is I'm just going to plug the charger, like the actual dock, into the car and it's just going to wirelessly charge my phone. So now there's one caveat, there's one UX problem is my car does not turn off its cigarette lighter port thing. So because of that, I have to unplug the charger when I'm done driving because I just don't want to drain the battery at all. Uh, but that's the only sort of UX problem. I'm going to be able to literally get in the car, literally drop this thing on the thing and just drive off. And then in addition to that, I'm not going to have to plug in my phone when I'm actually at home anymore. I'm just going to be able to like drop it on a table and kind of move on my life. And then I can also do the same thing with my Galaxy Buds, which I use. I can put those in the wireless charger. And then I can also use the wireless power share, which is also disabled due to that little metallic plate I have on the back. So that's where I'm at. This is one of those efficiency things where I'm trying to become more efficient with my stuff. I want a slimmer phone. I'm going to keep the otter box, obviously. Like if I go to the beach or something, I'm definitely putting an otter box on because it has port covers and crap. So the otter box is definitely going to still be there in my life. But I like the idea of having this cradle because I can move a car to car easily. I can wirelessly charge. I'm not going to have to plug the phone in ever again. And that's uh, that, that. There's my there's my UX thing. Now, Mike. Okay, I'm touching my chest again. Mike called me a diva for this and said that that's too much or something, something along those lines. I'm trying to di- trying to uh, ruin your argument. So I think I'm just being efficient. I don't know what you're doing. I mean, my my only stipulation is. 
while you're doing this, you are not allowed to plug your phone in at all. If your phone is about to die, you have to wirelessly charge it or you just let it die. Now, I will say one thing. I work on another podcast and we have to plug it in to get the, I load the podcast onto my phone. I have to. Oh, okay. But you're not charging it. No, I mean, mean, it's charging. It's it's technically charging, but you're not using it for charging. That's fine. It's data transfer for like 12 seconds or something. I'll allow it. But that's the only reason that you're plugging it in. Okay, because I grab we'll the phone. We'll check back and in with it. you in a month. It might be horrible. And see what happens. It might be it horrible. Might be horrible. Yeah. Because I don't. Cur- I'm I don't how it goes. know if my home one is fast charging compatible. Mm-hmm. I can't remember. We'll see. But it's a Samsung one, so mm-hmm. it might be. Who knows? Maybe. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, we'll give it a go. I'm gonna see what happens. Um, I might just plug it in sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not plugging in. You're not plugging it in. No, <laughs> you're not. This is. The challenge is you're not plugging it in. Fuck. Nope. Um, I will find out if you plug it in. I will partially commit. To, yeah, okay. okay. I'll partially you're commit full, to You're that. fully committing on the podcast, live on the air, to all the people. Okay, I'll, I'll say this. Everyone I'll say this. To, yeah. I'll say this. If, if the wireless car charger works with my vent and works, I will attempt the challenge. Okay, yeah, yeah. If, if the, you know, obviously, yeah. if the whole thing works, then yes. Because yes. I've never yeah. tried a wireless charger with this phone. I've also never tried a wireless charger on a in a car. God okay. knows. <laughs> like, and I also right. don't usually use a vent, vent one. I usually like suction it to the wall. So we're going to see. It's all new. Yep. Sunday's at nine. Um, fuck, I had, I had to do it. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, this episode's pretty loaded. Um, it's pretty conversational, we think. It's going to be about web uh, design stats in 2020. And it's from an article from uh, SiteJet. So literally called Web Design Statistics 2020. So we're going to be kind of pulling some of the points from there. Mike's going to kind of go through it and we'll do a conversation. Now, this episode might get pretty long as it's already kind of gotten kind of long. And this is pretty conversational, we think. So if it does get to that point, we may not do a web news, just an FYI. But I do have a web news prepared that we'll either do this week or next week. So Mike, please take it away. All right, let's do this. So you've kind of given a good introduction there. Uh, SiteJet did a survey of a bunch of web designers, <clears throat> mostly self-employed from what I understood, um, or business owners, stuff like that. Not so much people that are working for like a, a large agency, uh, as, as far as I understood it, because of the questions being asked, and you'll understand once I go over this. Um, but I'm just going to get right into it with the breakdown of the stats. Uh, some of them are really interesting. Some of them are very predictable, but also nice to have like numbers associated with and solidifying your own opinions, but we'll see what happens. So first segment here is the challenges of web design. So this will be kind of the, you know, what people hate, do the biggest challenges. And the first one is biggest challenges. So what do web designers think are the their biggest challenges for the last year? Uh, and I'll break down the stats here. First, first one with an overwhelming 46% finding new clients. Next is profitability and pricing at 24%. Then keeping up with the industry standards at ten percent, then time management at eight percent, difficult clients at seven, and managing a team at two percent. So it's interesting to me <clears throat> that finding new clients is the the dominant one here. Um, it makes sense because obviously that one is kind of really ambiguous. Like, how do you find new clients? Uh, and there's some actual, there's some questions later on that go into how people find new clients, which is kind of cool too. But it does make sense. Like when, when you're in the a transitionary period, especially it's a worry and it's like, it's obviously a challenge. Like when you're going from one client to another, or when you're finishing up a client and you're like, okay, I need another client because that's the whole point of your business is you have to always be busy. You have to always, you know, have something on the go if you, that's your primary income. So that does make sense. The next one is, I I think resonates with me the most over finding new clients. Like I would probably rank it one if I, if I had a choice and that's profitability and pricing. And that one, I don't know. It's just, it's one of those things like it's always hard to price a project. I don't know about you, Matt. Like whenever we sit down and are like pricing a project, we're like, is this too much? Is this too little? Every single time, no matter what the price that we give, those are questions that are always going in my head. And the other thing is like, it's always hard to predict the amount of hours you're going to put into a project. Like you try your best uh, based on your previous experience, but you never know how the communication aspect of the project is going to go. You never know how the back and forth, how how many issues are going to come up, the requirements get like, there's so many 
variables to every single project that this does become a huge pain point. I don't know if you have any input on that. Yeah, now. I would definitely say so. I would. The reason why I waited until to kind of talk now is because I think these two go hand in hand, the finding new clients and the profitability and pricing. So maybe not with the profitability part. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's in there too. Uh, basically, what I was going to say was that finding new clients is absolutely difficult. But I would say that we would get, usually from references from your current clients, you would normally get a fair bit of, you know, referrals. But the issue actually is the pricing for those people. So if you're, I don't know, you did a job for someone and then they referred you uh, to your co- to their cousin. So their cousin, they, they're they going to think, oh, I can get a discount because like th- th- this is my, this is my cousin's web guy sort of thing. And that really isn't the case in most cases. Like there's only so much you could shave off. And so that's where the prime of the profitability comes in. And also because it's somebody new completely, the price can really scare them off. So, I mean, this is, I mean, this is like a, a random thing, but like, I don't even know if I mentioned this on the show before, but like I collect, I collect like old Pepsi stuff and I'm into like haggling with people like with antiques. So I'm bringing it out of the web dev space for intentionally to kind of like show an example. One of the hardest things to do if the, if the item is not priced is actually talk to the person about the price. So me as a buyer and sometimes I'm the seller, but me as the buyer will 100% of the time ask them what the price is. Now, the reason why you do that is because you don't want to insult the person and you don't want to scare them off. The problem with something like web design and web development is that they'll usually come to you, especially if they're not tech savvy, and say, hey, you know, I have this idea. I want to build this car garage and blah, blah, blah. I don't know, whatever. What what can you do for me? And because it's it's just a casual conversation at that point and you don't have all the feature gath- gathering, you can do what kind of one of two things. You can kind of cower away from the price and say, let's talk more. Sometimes that's a red flag for them. They think, whoa. This guy's probably going to be too expensive. The problem is, is that you, when you only have that casual conversation, realistically should be quoting a higher or mid-high price. And then you kind of have to say, well, it could be lower. Now, there's an argument to be had about, you know, you should be attracting clients that have money and stuff like that. There's an argument there. But regardless, if you're a general web agency that, you know, accommodates for most, if not all budgets... This is the hardest point, both of them, because you're going to scare like this initial tactic, this initial interaction almost always involves price and almost always just scare them away. If you have that, if you have that conversation with them, that little casual one in the beginning, you haven't done, you know, your full feature set and all that. And then you, and then you, they ask, Hey, what do you think ballpark? And you say a grand and they were thinking 250. Sometimes they'll back away so much. They won't even say, Hey, I was thinking 250. Now that's not always the case. But like this is one of the bigger problems. Sometimes I tell, they'll say two fifty and that'll scare us off. Sometimes they'll say they'll say two fifty and they'll be like, "Oh, okay, actually, hang on a minute. You know, did you mean this by this feature? Like, are you cutting this down? Are we cutting this down? Like, is this necessary? Why do you have this? You know, you can start you know trimming the project to make the two fifty make sense, for example. But you don't have the advantage like you would in a physical goods like that antique market, like I said, because I would I literally go up to somebody and say, "What can you like?" What can you do for me on this? That's usually what I say. Or like, if there's no, if there's a price, I say, what can you do for me on this? If there is a, if, if there is a price, excuse me, then I say, what can you do for me on this? If there is no price, I always say, what are you thinking on this? Because what can you do for me introduces the, pre, the, pre, the, this is the fuck, what is this? The America Pickers. This introduces the, uh, it introduces like a, like, so let's say the, the price takes 300 bucks. When I say, what can you do for me? I'm already asking for a discount, but I'm telling them to tell me. So I'm not insulting them. Usually. And this doesn't work for everyone. Of course, it's a negotiation. It's a game. But this type of thing is a serious problem in the in the web industry or in digital goods, I'd say, myself. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing is like in negotiation tactics, like you mentioned, it is always better to actually be the one that asks for the price because you're not giving away your cards. So a lot of the time when you go into a negotiation – uh, you yourself in your head have like a minimum and maximum that you're willing to do. They, the person that you're trying to get the price from, they don't have that or they do have their own minimum maximum. What happens a lot of the time is 
or at least for us, I, the, what I've noticed is that we'll hit it way over or way under, right? And if we can get like, and I've heard this work sometimes, it hasn't worked for us, but if we can, if you can go to a client and be like, what's your budget? And for them, they're like, okay, well, you know, maybe they'll try to lowball you a little bit, but a lowball to them could be your, you know, the top of your budget, the top of your, what you're asking. And then you're both happy. That's like the, the ideal situation. And that's ha- that happens sometimes because it's just the pricing in the, in these kinds of situations are so out of, all over the place. Like we, we've had a lot of discussions about how much stuff costs. Um, the ranges are way out of, out of control, like absolutely out of control, like 10,000, 40,000, you know, 5,000, same website. Like it's just, it's, it's just it's crazy. literally that crazy. We, yeah, we, we literally, we literally found crazy. a CMS the other day, a CMS that did other stuff like marketing and the whole bit, like a, a marketing CMS suite, a digital marketing suite. If you wanted, this is not including like the subscription fees. There's a subscription fee, or I think it might be a perpetual license. This is not including the license. If you wanted an additional server because you needed more performance or whatever that additional server does for you, $60,000 upfront. 60 grand. What is going on? I don't 60 know. 60 like, grand? I, I, what did yeah, you buy? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I mean, I, maybe for, you know, people that are selling a million items at a minute or something, it, it, that doesn't make sense. But it, it, it's literally like the, the range is ludicrously all over the place. So it's very hard to do pricing. And that's why we're spending so much time on it. And there's like just so many techniques. Um, you were mentioning the whole like, if, you know, they, they you can be so far off and that could be a, offensive or whatever. I think this year I've I've approached it in a different aspect where if they lowball, I don't take offense and I just want to move away from the project as quick as possible in that kind of sense. I'll help in any way I can because sometimes you just have these situations where it's a family member or something like that and you go in and you pitch them and you, you start talking about price and they're expecting very low, like you said, like 250 500 and your price is like, you know, in the three to five thousand dollar range so that that pricing discrepancy no matter how much you do no matter how much you cut that won't go away like that below family rate that is below family rate it's too much yeah it's too much right like and arguably in my opinion family rate should be the same as your rate like when you're doing something for a friend or family this is my advice to people out there that have friends and family with businesses don't ask for a family rate because these you know there, that means not only are you paying less money, you're taking away time from the person that where they could be generating more money and stuff like that. So just because you're friends and family, you should be trying to help the friend or family as much as you possibly can. Have them decide how what the family rate is and stuff like that and offer maybe to pay more sometimes if you're if you can just to be just to be a good person. I, I don't know. It just it doesn't make sense to me where like. Sometimes a family member will come up to you and be like, I need your services, but I'm going to pay you like next to nothing. Like that's, yeah, a dollar an hour or something. A and, dollar an and, hour. And sometimes like that's, that's the case. If it's – if they're going to – if they if they're thinking 200 bucks and it, you have a couple people working on the project, it could be like a dollar an hour. Like it could yeah. – the project could take 200 hours. Yeah. It could be a $5,000 project. So in those cases, the, the best thing that I found to do is be like, okay, like no problem. We understand your budget. That's completely fine. Uh, we're just – we're indifferent – areas right now like we, we just can't take on a project of that size and that caliber and that's perfectly okay like be completely upfront with them and then be like if you need help finding someone or vetting a web developer like we can you know ask the right questions we can give you some smart questions to ask stuff like that and then we can you know we can help you in those kinds of ways but for now it's just it's too far off from our price point and we have no problem just you know pulling back and you know helping in different ways if that's okay and then you move on i find that that's I'm fully okay with that. And going into a negotiation with that in mind also gives you a little bit more power because you're not just trying to get as any money from any client. That's when we started this business with Matt, like every single negotiation was like, we have to close this negotiation because we don't have any other clients. We need money. Like no matter what the cost, like we have, like, I don't care if we're working for a dollar an hour, we need this client. At this at this point in the game, we're not at that stage, and that's great for us. So we can have that leverage of saying no. Again, the power of no helps sometimes. One one thing 
One thing that I thought was interesting too, and and I've heard this off and on, I, it's off, often a point of contention actually, is I don't really know where I sit on the idea of doing free portfolio work. So there's something to be said about actual portfolio work where if I'm passionate about, I don't know, I'm passionate about mic stands, that's weird, but it's something in front of me, and I just want to make you know a website listing all the different things, and then I make it super nice, and I polish it and everything, and I add that to you know D- DDD, Digital Dynasty Designs, that's Mike and my company's portfolio, there, you know, that, that's totally acceptable. But a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll, they'll go to an actual client and say, you know, hey, like, you know, your budget doesn't fit or whatever, I'll just do it for free as a portfolio item. And what Mike and I have found is it actually doesn't help as much as you think. Um, you know, we cut people deals and stuff like that to have our name kind of, you know, maybe shout, like shout it out or displayed somewhere, or we've like put an ad on their site and stuff like that for free. And, and that that's, that's fair. That's, you know, more or less marketing. But I find that people are, especially in the beginning, they're shortchanging themselves a little bit too much doing things for absolute, absolutely free rather than just, you know, less like what Mike and I were doing. I don't really remember doing a site for free myself and, you know, we've advanced quite well. I don't remember doing one for free. Did we? One site was done for free and it was, but it was for charity. Oh, okay. To be fair. That's like a donation. Yeah. Well, yeah. So we've done like a donation. donation. Yeah. yeah. We've um, done a donation. We've done like a donation where we, uh, where we pay for like the, the site's hosting the domain and we did the work for the site. Yeah. So like, I mean. No, it, was, it was for a legit, li- like an actual charity. It, it, yeah, so. It's for a, yeah, it's a chair. It, it yeah. was a charitable no- donation to a charity that needed a site. Yes. So. We did that that was the free. only time we did it, though. And I agree with you that I don't think you should be doing free work. If, On the other hand, if you're a 13-year-old kid and your parents have like a coffee shop or something and they need a site, I think that that would, you know, if you're going to make a site for your parents, whatever, like that's fine. Up to your discretion. I'm just Up saying, like, don't 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 be like, I'll do a free one, yeah. another free one. Yeah, don't free don't one, go right? to you know down the street and go into like a, a shop and be like, hey, I, I want to do your site for free for a portfolio. Don't do that. Go in there and be like, say that I'm a new developer and I want to get some experience. Uh, would you will be willing to let me do this site for you know X amount of money, like a, a, a not a low ball, but ne- necessarily, but like a reasonable amount for a new developer. So, you know, $500 or something like that. Something that would make, you know, get you up in the morning uh, and get you excited about finishing a product because it's better for both of you. It's better for them that they're paying you. And it's better for you that you're getting paid because you're more motivated. They're motivated to get a better product, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the time is money. It's just a better experience. But just realize that we're, we, this, this episode might go over time. (laughs) <laughs> this, this might yeah, be we're already, already at 34 minutes and we're on the first yeah, yeah. the first major point, <laughs> sub point two. <laughs> so it's all right. I'm gonna move on to the next uh the next statistics here. And w- that's what web designers hate. So there's a question to web designers, what do they hate? Number one thing web designers hate is growing and acquiring new customers. That's at 34%. Next thing is managing their business at 24%. Interacting with customers at 15%, the creative process at 9%, managing a team at 9%, and then other is 9% as well. So Wait, where did you jump I, to here? Did you do keep, next keeping point. up industry standards and stuff? What's going on here? So I, I went through that. I already went through that. We're not going to be able to go through every Wait, single no, no, point no, in Come detail. on now. We're going to talk for no, half no, an no, hour. Gonna, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, half an hour. We can't go through every sub point in detail. We're going to have a seven and a half hour yeah. episode. It's fine. We're going <laughs> pull, pull to have to pick the more interesting parts of every of everyone <laughs> and focus on them. That's for sure. So with what web designers hate, like it's – I growing and acquiring new customers, I don't hate that that much. No, I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't hate that either. I don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why that's number one. Um, managing, managing. Yeah, you know what it might be. Like, honestly, though, it might be, <laughs> and we're one of these, but we don't hate this. Is there's like there's a type of web dev slash web designer out there that will do something where they only use a certain thing, whether they just use WordPress and they don't custom code anything, uh, and they just use WordPress with a certain theme builder or something. Um, there's also the people that only use something like Webflow, but we're a general sort of like we do Webflow and custom and this and that and like all this other stuff. So I wonder if the hatred comes from the variety of technologies available 
to people. And it's like an anxiety point where they're like, holy crap, like we've never used Webflow before. We already have six other CMSs under our belt. And this freaking guy wants to do wants to do Webflow. Now we got to learn Webflow too. I just don't think that that's a very big pain point. Like I don't th- – because usually when you're dealing with a customer, they're not going to be the ones suggesting, you know, uh, the, the the technology that you're using. Like we, we've had some customers that do that. I agree. But I think that that is actually not relevant relative to the industry. I agree. Usually the customer would be like, this is my problem. I need a website for my, you know, for my business. Please create this website. And then you go – and create that website and be like, here's the website. Here's, I don't, who cares about what technology you use? Log into this CMS and edit your content, period. No conversation back and forth. I think that that's the typical process. So I don't think the technology is the issue. I think it's just people. And as this points out, look, interacting with customers is up there. Is up in, in the what web designers hate. I think people just like don't want to deal with cold calling. Uh, people don't want to deal with responding to email as much people don't want to deal with stuff like that like it is tough to acquire new customers when you're first starting out especially it's very very difficult you have to be lucky in my opinion especially if you want good customers you have to be lucky and and, or thrifty or grind like you have to have some something that sets you apart yeah right once you get going though and we'll cover this a little bit later as well uh word of mouth just kind of spreads and all you have to do is do a really good job. Just do a good job for your clients. And then your, you know, your clients will tell other people that you're doing a good job at a reasonable price and it'll just spread and spread and spread and spread. And you'll have way too much work or you'll have, you know, you'll have to make the decisions that we have to make where we don't can't do the $250 jobs or the $500 jobs anymore because it's just going to take away from our larger jobs or from other projects and stuff like that. So... That's why I think I don't hate growing and acquiring new customers because we we had a very simple – we got lucky with our first customers. <coughs> we put a lot of work in. We did a good job and it's grown from there. Um, that's why I think managing the business would be my number one hate. I don't do much of it. Like you, Matt, you handle most of it. But like I've been doing a lot of the QuickBooks stuff this week because of the whole. Christ, uh, I, that's and, I hate accounting. Holy yeah, crap! Yeah, and that but that's managing Holy the business. Holy crap! And do I hate accounting? Any, really, anything that takes me away from my billable hours or my actual like programming work or my management work stuff like that, like management of a team, um, I don't like that much because I feel like it's a waste. Yeah, yeah, I know it's not. I know it's not because you need to do it. But I feel like it's a waste, so it pisses me off. Uh, I don't mind interacting with customers. That's the next one here. Well, I, I, I was actually going to say, just to sorry to interrupt there, but mm-hmm. I will say managing the business is my favorite part, uh, one of my most favorite parts. But I, it's because I like this, like making decisions based on oh, this worked and this worked. Let's try this idea. Like, like, I like having this idea. Let's try this idea. Let's bounce this idea off a of mic. Let's try this. Oh, I'll delegate this and I'll go to this person for this. Or, oh, we can skip this part because we could do... Like, it's. I like doing that type of thing. I like being sort of dynamic in the decision-making. I hate accounting. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't... It cannot be understated. I, I read something one time, like, two days ago or yesterday. It was like... And, like, I'm not an accountant, so don't quote me on this. It was something like the equity of the cost account of the cost of goods sold reimbursed or something. And I, I lost it. I, I did, I'd take a break. I was like, what the fuck? Did somebody write down here? Like, what? And it's like, oh, yeah. Like, you know, no bigs. Oh, all right. Next time I make a business decision, I better better consider whether it's a reimbursement of my cost of goods sold equity. Like, what? I don't think that's right. Like I'm from memory, from angry, uh, that might be right. from angry memory. It could be right. Who knows? But like, holy that crap! Right. Come on, guys. Like who? 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 That's all I gotta say. There's accountants out there that like their job, though. Like there's you're. I don't like it. I'm I'm with you on this one. I don't like it. But there's accountants out there that like their job, and that's why we have an accountant. I just wish we had a bookkeeper, which we might get. Which we might we, we might do this. we might do this like we this might is, do we might we might, we might take the plunge and get a bookkeeper because I don't want to deal with this anymore like I'm literally <laughs> literally so losing much. actual probably years of my life 
sweating, yeah. <laughs> literally sitting on my chair doing doing QuickBooks and sweating the entire time. Because yeah. it's like the thing that sucks about it too is it's like it's not like what we're doing is it is an extravagant. We're not we're literally just entering our receipts and we keep our receipts all year like it's not a big deal. And, you know, you miss a couple receipts and you make those miscellaneous expenses or whatever. Like, it's not a big deal. There's nothing going on. Everything's fine. But the entire time I'm doing that, I'm sweating and panicking. Even though it's simple, I'm freaking out the whole time. To- the whole time. Like, I'm like, oh, my God. Is this like, is this a, a, a subscription? Is this a, is this a dues? Like, what do I do? And then what's the date? And then the, the date of the invoice is different than the date it was sent. So it's like, do I do the sent date or the, or the paid one? And then, like, I just start to panic. And I start freaking out. And then yesterday, I started talking to Mike. And, like, I just gave up. Where I tried to split. If anyone uses QuickBooks, you can, like, split a transaction. I tried to split. I don't know why. Uh, pretty late at night. A, like, a, a subscription fee for Balsamic. But it was, like, a single month. And then I was like, wait, which week is this? And I'm like, wait, what the fuck am I... Like, why am I doing this per week? And then I just started to panic. And I shut it down for the night. I... I <laughs> it's... It's out of it's out of control. Like it is, it's out of it's out of control, and and it's so easy. Like I know people out there being like, just enter your receipts, you idiot. Thank you, thank you for that. It might be a phobia, actually. I just re- damn it, I keep up my mic. It, it might be a phobia. <laughs> yeah, you're freaking out right now. Like I can visually I, see I, Matt just talking about this. Matt is freaking. I, I'm out. starting like, to sweat. Yeah, absolutely freaking. I should wear my bad my, my sweaty panic, shirt. Yeah. Like I yeah. I intentionally when I do accounting, this is not a joke. When I do accounting, I have to put on old clothes. Because I sweat so much. <laughs> it's such a ridiculous... I, okay. I, I, I just... I can't handle it. Like, I just... I almost failed it in high school. I almost failed accounting in high school. It was a narrow miss. I remember one time we were doing a balance statement. We are doing a balance sheet. Excuse me. Balance sheet. And this this big old thing. And you, like... You plug these numbers. You know, you do all these formulas in Excel. You start tubbing in the numbers. And, like, it's like... It's like 500 numbers. And at the end of that balance sheet, as a balance sheet does, it balance... It's what has to balance. It has to balance. And that thing was off by like, by like fifty four thousand dollars, and I, <laughs> I, lo- I lost it. I was a like I fully lost it. And it was like it was like a, I put a period or something instead of a comma, and I lost it. It was, it was I was over. Like I just could I, I could handle it, and I just handed it in. It's like no worries, and I just like from the balance sheet. The balance sheet is like a critical cornerstone, and then you're supposed to make an income sheet from it. And everything, all that was wrong. I just I just built it, handed it in. <laughs> I couldn't. Couldn't take it. Yep. I, I think if we do a Twitter poll this week, it's going to be uh, who who is okay with doing their taxes at the end the, of the, the year. The Twitter poll three? Fuck yeah. Yeah, Twitter poll three is about is going to be about the year end. Oh. Very, very trendy topic right now. Man. Got to get, yeah, gotta get the, uh, gotta get turn the air conditioner on. I don't know what's going on here. We're getting yeah, sweating. Yeah. But yeah, so yeah, in, I mean, interacting <laughs> with customers, that makes sense. People don't like to interact with customers. I don't mind it. That's one of my things that I, I don't, I don't mind. The creative process is one I want to talk about real quick. I don't, as in like a design perspective, like designing a page out, I don't think I like it that much. But the creative process of like solving an issue or a business logic problem, I do like. So I don't know. I, guess I don't, I don't mind laying out a page. Um, <coughs> I will say yeah. that one of the things I hate about the creative process is I don't like how. So generally speaking, and this might just be an us problem, uh, but when we do the creative process, we more or less try to give the customer the prototype or the screenshot or the wireframe, whatever the project calls for, the more or less what the finished product will look like. And I much prefer to lay out so if i do it myself let's say i was building my own project i would lay out maybe a prototype or a or a uh, wireframe and then i would iterate on that ui so the ui would still look very similar but i would do several iterations actually live until i like it i do find that i will put together what i built in a wireframe or a prototype and i just hate it the first couple of times and I and this is every time. And then I have to like iterate, 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 like mess around with the fonts, mess around with this, mess around with that, mess around with the colors. And then I eventually just get there. And it's not a super long process. It's like half a day or a day, depending on size. But it's something that I definitely prefer to iterate on. And I will say that if you're giving somebody a prototype or you're giving somebody an actual diagram of what something's going to look like, oftentimes it more or less is going to be expected to be that. And I just feel like it never 
it's never a good impression of, of what the product is. I feel like with a web with a website because it there's so many different screen sizes out there because there's so many different screen resolutions and everything. I feel like it really needs to be seen in person, and that's just something that I could use a prototyping software or something, of course, but. That's raising the overhead a fair bit in comparison to what we normally deal with. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with that statement too because just showing showing a client one view of something is very... It doesn't show the whole scope and showing a client too much also confuses the client. So it, it's, it, it's a mess. It's a balance. So that's another... <clears throat> like interacting with clients mixed with the creative process is kind of tough. So I, I agree with that. But... We're both chugging Sorry, water here. We've been talking throat, a lot here. My throat is just extremely, extremely dry. Because you've been, you've been why, sweating but... because you've been doing accounting today, haven't you? Probably. I see you in that QuickBooks. Yeah. I watched your login, login things. Watch it in fear to see if you were online. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to actually switch it up a little bit right now. I'm going to actually do just a quick run through through what do web designers love. So it's the same questions and it's... The, the percentages are different based on what they actually like doing out of those things. So the creative process is actually number one at 64%. So web designers love to create, which kind of makes sense because this is talking about web designers more than web developers. I, I understand that. That's why they do the job. That's why they like the job. They're actually creating the design for the process. Then the next thing is growing and acquiring new customers. So some people really like that process and I kind of agree with that. I do like the process of, you know, establishing relationships and going on from that is interacting with customers at 9%. So, you know, going right into establishing relationships and all that. And then there's managing a business, 8%, managing a team. No one likes to manage teams. So I guess web designers are just not good managers. Well, I was, uh, I was almost saying this sounds and like, I mean, I guess we kind of do both because we're a small business, but I kind of almost think that this particular statistic, managing the team, feels like they're introdu- they're uh, interviewing the technical staff, like the actual developers, because I will find that developers, at least from my you know limited sample size, generally don't like to be the manager. Yeah, I guess I guess it's a very low percentage of them that do, and that's why this this kind of reflects that. Right, but this is like this is the designers. I always thought the designers would be more creative, more ready to do stuff. Although now that I say that out loud, if you're the designer and you you're trying to convey what you visualize in your head as a team lead to your team, and you're unable to do that, and they produce something that is not what you had in your head, that's probably annoying. Yeah. Hundred percent. So with that, so we kind of just I just wanted to go through that really quickly because we already discussed every single one of these points anyway, and move on to the next thing here, which is how long does it take to build a website from scratch? So this one I find really interesting and really relevant to a previous discussion that we've just had on the whole profitability. Like, how do you do profitability? <clears throat> because there's no way to know how many hours it's going to take. So, and with that being said, uh, the breakdown is this 11 to 20 hours, 31%, 21 to 40 hours, 29%, 41 to 60 hours, 13%, zero to 10 hours is 18. And then 61 plus hours is nine. What this kind of shows is a really close spectrum where people just don't know. Like the pie chart, if you look at it graphically, is essentially like a circle with even chunks, like very close to even chunks. Yeah. Because it's just all over the place. Now, obviously, project size matters and stuff like that, and that's not taken into this. But even with that, like it's something like going back to a car example, when you're a mechanic and you're changing brakes on a car, you know how much time that's going to take. You know how much to charge for that. You know the resources. You're chuck toss back the water. That, I can't, that's the I second. Can't, my throat is just that, dead. That's literally <laughs> the second like body of water you've drank tonight. I know. I just Save had my the wife planet. bring in water because my I can't I can't talk right now. Really sorry. Okay. Anyway, uh, it's just it. I find it interesting that like the spectrum is so wide, and they they ask quite a few people. So you know, experienced developers, not experienced developers, no one knows <laughs> how many hours a website's going to take, and every hour every website is just like. 
is it going to take 61 hours? Is it going to take 11 to 20 hours? Like we don't know. And you're, you're charging for something again with that, with that car example, like you don't know if it's going to be a brake change, is it going to be an engine change, whatever, because let's say you're making the same website. So, uh, a pizza shop comes to you, make a pizza shop site. It took you 20, 40 hours. Another pizza shop comes, you're assuming it's going to take 40 hours. But what happens is in the communication process, the pizza shop stops replying to you. The pizza shop doesn't give you the right content. So you make something and then they come back and be like, okay, well, that's not what we wanted because we didn't reply to you. That happens. And then they give you more content and then you make it and then they come back and be like, no, we want this design. Like every customer is completely different. A customer can't come back to a car shop and be like, that's not how I wanted you to install those brakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's – there's a big discrepancy in web development and that's why the price discrepancies are so wide because the hours are so different and developer to developer. Some developers are more efficient. Some developers are better at doing work but they take longer time. Some developers do a really bad work but they can do it in five hours. Like – how do you price something well, in, in that scenario? That's actually interesting that you mentioned that because there's there's also like there's the there's the angle of again I know this this survey was pointed at designers, but if you're talking about like a web development team, so the development and the design to, together, and you're making the final final product, there's actually a different level of product you can de- deliver to a customer. Some people will deliver something that has like all sample text and absolutely no creative thought was put into the copywriting or it's just all the lorem ipsum stuff like 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 placeholder text and that will allow you know that's that allows you to save time but it gives a less a lesser in my opinion presentation of the site. Sometimes you got to use Laura Mipsum, but like sometimes you could you know, put a little creativity into like the titles to make it look well. Or people will use just any stock photo instead of like proper stock photos for whatever the site actually is. And so it makes the site look weird there too. And then there's other people that will hold the customer's hand all the way through where there's already a doc, like they make the documentation on how to use the CMS. The CMS already has a bunch of placeholder text. The e-commerce is say turned on and everything, like everything's ready to rock. And it's just a matter of hitting that publish button and then you go to the presentation with the client when you go to hand it off and everything's ready to go and you got a full set of guides and everything. Like there are different levels to that. And the reason why I bring that up is there is a lot of work in doing that. There's a lot of work in putting guides together. There's a lot of work in like buttoning everything up really nice and make it all look all fancy. There's a lot of work put into those little steps, meeting the client again, whatever. Training them, maybe something you want to do a training session, a consultation session with them uh, about how to edit things or how the SEO works on the site or whatever. That stuff does take up hours. And when, one of the issues that anyone, I would say, has with estimating projects, especially in this field, is everyone thinks, well, I'll just download a Webflow template, edit it, and move on. But then you're like, oh, wait. Like, when you get there, you're like, oh, wait. How does this animation work? Even then, like, something like Webflow. I bring Webflow to the table because it's sort of like a rapid, in my opinion, a rapid fire development tool for a website. But even though it's rapid fire and you're using a template, there's still a lot to consider. Oh, like, this shadow looks weird with this text. I got to move this around. Oh, this color scheme isn't quite there. I got to set these different colors. I got to get the colors. Oh, this, like, this slogan's wrong. Oh, the customer actually wants to be able to edit the SEO, so I can't just edit it and save it for him. Oh, we need to have this email system set up. Oh, they need this like forwarding system. Oh, they need rules in their email. We need to help them with that. All of this stuff is all together. A lot of my job is is that, is as I go in and I manage a whole bunch. Like I do a lot of server admin stuff. I do a lot of user management. I change procedures for people and stuff like that. A hundred percent. Like a lot of that is that. Um, a lot of it also is data management. Like uh, one of the things that people do not consider is when they make a page, okay, they make a page and they get all the data already and everything else. And oftentimes a web agency will say, okay, you get like one month of free updates. You know, you got any problems or anything, come and come to us and we'll get, do, do that, whatever. One month, two months, whatever you offer or none, whatever. But like, let's just say a month standard. You do that. One of the things that I, that I find is, is the customer will change? Well, the customer will let's say write eight, 18 blog posts, and then be like, "Ah, eh, you know, hmm, I don't think we need a header picture, but I want those pictures to be in this other, like in this other field." 
And because you're kind of obligated, you're like, damn, like, you know, the, the, the program, the CMS cropped it and I got to grab that. I got to find that source material and I have to go and add another field. And then I have to re-upload those photos for the client or whatever, or you can try to convince them to do it, but they don't understand. They think it's just a simple flip over. Like all of that stuff, all of those semantics take hours and sometimes take the most amount of hours. Think about making a page from scratch, HTML, CSS, JS. Think about how making a page from scratch. And let's just say first iteration, like you're going for a first draft. So you make it just look nice. You use the company colors and everything. Everything's fine. Think about the amount of time it took you to contact the customer to get all the cust- all the, the content, the pa- the pictures, the text, the whatever. Think about all the, all the amount of time it took to for them to answer after, okay? And then for them to call you back, to ask for changes. You do the changes. You send it back. They do iterations like this repeats and repeats and repeats a few times until they're happy, Right. All customers are different, but as a general thing, they're going to have a couple of things they're going to want changed. A lot of that time is, you know, send something, wait, send something, wait. And then you have the question of, and this isn't, this is going a little bit off of the, the amount of time spent per project, but because you have, like, even if you're waiting on a client, they take three days to answer. You do not, even though you're kind of sitting there, you do not want to do client acquisition because if you try to start up another project, now you're going to be doubly as busy because that guy, the original guy, might have a bunch of stuff for you to do. So now you might have 120 hours of stuff lined up all of a sudden for just like a two-month period. It's going to be a whole like disaster. Like who knows, right? So that's yeah, that's what exactly. I, that's what I mean. Yeah, and yeah, you just went down rabbit holes upon rabbit holes that every web designer probably has gone down at some point. Every web developer, every business owner, kind of like that's dealing with this business as had to deal with. Um, but with that being said, let's move on to the next segment here, <clears throat> which is other interesting takes. So this is just other, you know, questions that were asked, not necessarily negative. Can't talk today. <clears throat> I can talk for like <clears throat> one second and then my throat just dies. Come on, bud. Okay. I'm going to put, try to, I'm going to try to power through here. Mike, Mike right. clears his throat's Koran. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, that sounds like a, that sounds uh, like a, an oblivion name. From the Elder Scrolls. Yeah, maybe like a rapper name or something. <laughs> but I, I, I did the nerdiest, like I had the nerdiest example. It's like, man, <laughs> Elder Scrolls 3, crane. you sound like an Argonian name or something. Yeah. And then you're just like, yeah, probably a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the question was, how often are websites updated? And in th- this question was, uh, is based on like, when you finish a website and you're with a client and you have like a maintenance contract, how often do you go back and actually do something for that client? First thing here, monthly, 60%. That makes sense. Most most maintenance contracts are monthly, right? Then there's bi-monthly at 11%, quarterly at 21%, which is interesting. Uh, and then other is at 8%. There's other like segments of people. People do like once every three months or whatever. Um, so... I think that makes sense. Like, I don't think there's much to talk about really here because we, I mean, we usually, most of the time, monthly is pretty accurate. M- monthly is the contract we, or the contract of the agreement will usually put people on 100%. But, but like, what about like actual work that you do? Because I think this is based more on work than actual agreement. So you can have an agreement that you're paying monthly, but how often is it that you're only doing it once a month? Is it? I would say for a website that is updated frequently in terms of a CMS. So the user is updating it. I'd say monthly is, I'd say monthly is a fair contract because there's a fair chance each month. I'd say 50, 50 each month. And with that being said, then I would say every other month you would be, okay, bi-monthly. yeah, bi-monthly mm-hmm. is probably what you would be doing on the average. Okay. Because when the customer is, co- when the customer, good. When the customer is actually involved a lot in the site, they'll notice things. Uh, they'll actually want things changed and they may accidentally do something. I don't know, delete a page or something. And then they'll, you know, there'll be a problem and you have to go and fix it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Uh, next question here is how do web designers mainly communicate with their clients? I found this interesting. Uh, email 74%. That makes sense. Phone or video calls, 16%. Yeah. Separate project management system. So I guess that's like Jira. I don't know if I've ever, I would ever want to ask a customer to communicate. Like, can you imagine getting, getting someone to log into Jira and make a ticket and talk to you through the, like 90% of our clients wouldn't be able to handle that. 
logging in. No, I would say the reason why it's at one percent is because these yeah. are probably corporate clients, and it may actually be their system. Maybe, it might be yeah, a real exactly. big, like real big corp, and they're like, "Hey, you want to call? You want to talk to us? You got to download, you know, our app." You might be right. Yeah, you you might be right. So then, design platform is the next one. This one I found interesting. I mean, these are web designers. Uh, so like something like um, Envision or you, revision notes and stuff. Revision notes. Uh, that's at two percent, so higher than separate project management software. I could see that working because you send them a link and then they can just immediately respond to that link. Like they don't have to log in sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which which is nice. Uh, and then there's like Slack at one percent, SMS at one percent, other at four percent. I'm surprised SMS isn't higher because yeah. I know in the states, S- like SMS or messaging in general, um, it's pretty popular. Excuse me, to RCS. Do all, like, Excuse me, RCS. Yeah, sorry, yeah, or iMessage. <laughs> much more, much more superior one. Apparently, I don't use it, but uh, I was, I would. Everyone ag- wants that blue bubble. Well, I would agree. Damn the, damn the iMessage. Um, and I only have one person I can RCS with, so that's that, 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 that uh, platform's <laughs> going fantastic. real well. Yeah, that platform's going real well. Yeah. Although it was seamless, but um, I will say it's weird because I, uh, we do have a, we do have a couple of clients that will, you know, email is a big one, but. I would say the emails almost seem like a more. I think we mentioned this before. They mo- they almost seem like a more formal way to communicate. I would actually actually say that th- like a lot of our clients, we when we move them to a messenger, they actually seem to like that, or not even move them to a messenger. Add like have a messenger as an option. So sometimes when let's say for example, I, we're emailing, 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 and then we have a call or something, and they're like, oh, I, I you know, I'll let you know when you can edit this today, like when, when you can take the site offline to do a patch, I'll just be like, Hey, text me. And that's me kind of inviting them to be like, Hey, just text me. And then what they'll end up doing is being like, Oh, okay. Now it's kind of informal enough where I can send them little FYIs instead of me drafting a whole email up. So uh, to be fair, uh, this question is mainly communicate. There is a separate question I haven't added to our show notes, but there's a separate question with like in general, what you use to communicate. And in that in that one, I, I believe SMS and all that is higher. Okay, okay, so that makes sense. Okay, so I think it makes sense exactly. Yeah, so like mainly we do use email yes. with most of our clients, right? Like SMS, like you said, on an occasional basis with like just casual, you know, updates and stuff like yeah. that. We do use that, but it's not our main thing. So yeah, I think it makes sense. All these kind of just solidify like yeah, everyone's doing the same thing. Great, awesome. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Let's move on. So, how do web designers get clients? This one's fairly simple, but it's also a little bit surprising. I didn't think it was this much. Word of mouth referrals is at 71%. That's a big one. I knew it was going to be big, but I didn't think it was that big. I, did, I also I also knew it was going to be big, but I, I thought it would be like 50%, and then it would be like everything else. Yeah, you know? I was thinking, I was thinking 45, 50. apparently that's how everyone, ev- like everyone gets all of their clients at as word Damn. of mouth. <laughs> Make, makes sense. I mean, like, yeah. We're not the only ones. Yeah. Yeah. Then the rest is like content marketing and organic SEO. So like your website just being there and people finding it with your SEO is 6%. Facebook, as the biggest social networking way to get clients, is at 3%. Twitter doesn't even count. Like Twitter was on there, but it was literally like there's no number. So no one gets clients off Twitter. Damn. Uh, LinkedIn is at 1%. <clears throat> Makes sense. Paid online advertising, so pay per click, is at three percent. So it's like, is it worth it? Probably not, from what I understand. Because what kind of clients are you going to get in that situation? Like you, you might get a good client, but it's pretty low. Uh, outbound marketing is at three percent. Not really sure what that is. Outbound marketing. <laughs> I don't know. I, I could check, but regardless, email marketing is at four percent. So that's one of the higher ones. Uh, email is still a big thing and email lists are still a big thing. And I actually, I, I think they're actually going up even more and more this year. I've been reading email, email lists are becoming a kind of more intimate way to contact your audience. Oh, we started ours. I mean, we did. Yeah, we did. Um, should we tell people how to sign up for it? Oh yeah. Um, keep talking and I'll pull up the link for myself. Yeah, okay, I'll I'll keep going. And then video marketing is at 2%. I don't see video marketing working very much. Uh, One one that I find interesting here is partnerships, which is at 2%. So partnerships would include like, you know, partnering with another business 
and doing client work for them and, you know, giving clients back and forth. So like if like for for instance, we are partnered with a business that's an IT business where if their clients need a website, they'll contact us and uh, we'll create that website for them and then have like a fee to pass back and forth between each other. So that's a partnership. So that's a 2% as well, which I guess makes sense. I thought it would be higher uh, because it's a good way to get clients. Events is at 2%, which is like if you go to a workshop or you go to like a, you know, a conference or something, hand out your business card, get a client like that. So that's face-to-face events. Um, and then others at 4%. So I, I think it makes sense. Like this this one, other than the fact that word of mouth referrals is so high, like I knew it would be high. Because oh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought I thought there'd be more. Every other one of these is is single digit. I honestly didn't think that was going to be yeah. the case. I thought we were going to have like yeah. a 45 and then probably like a 20 on something and then mm-hmm. it would go down. But like how would you do like ad, ad mob websites? Because most people that type in – <clears throat> for a small small web agency, there's no chance that you're gonna rank. No, like Squarespace, like the, Wix, you, all yeah, those Wix, guys, all those guys, everything. Mm-hmm. And there's and there's web website builders baked into most hosts out there. There's all kinds of stuff like that. And yeah, realistically, realistically, this is a pretty. I don't know. It see this is this is this is weird to me actually. I, I want to bring something up here. Is this this fa- like the Facebook, the LinkedIn, the all those like the social media there seem and content marketing and organic SEO throw those in there too. Like those are so low and they have so much money poured into them. Like it's actually nuts. I don't know, maybe not in this industry, but in general, holy crap, is there a lot of money poured into social media marketing and like, look at, at least in this industry. And according to this survey, look at what it's giving us. Now, maybe it's the industry. Like, I don't know. Could it be the 6%? Like you, you, you do it, you get your, cause it's, let's say, so here it's 6% for content marketing and organic SEO. You, you get, you know, you do it, do your 6%, you get one or two clients and then they word of mouth the rest. Is that kind of what we expect? I don't know, but it's maybe. weird. <laughs> There's no yeah. doubt about that. That's, it's weird. I think this just proves the point that you have to kind of be lucky and connected to start. Like you don't have to, but it's it's really helpful. Like when you start your business, ideally you want to start with already kind of a platform client in place or like someone that's already needing your services that you can build off of. Right. And that's not going to happen for everyone. And I understand that that's kind of like, you know, you can't generalize it to that point. But uh, I know a lot of you know, stories that I hear is of like people, you know, my church needed a website, my, uh, my family's restaurant needed a website, like, you know, et cetera, like something like that. That was their starting yes, point. Yes, 100%. It wasn't just like, oh, I want to be a web designer and I put myself out there and I found someone that for 100% happens, but I think that that's less likely. Well, like less. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> no, go well, ahead. Well, apparently you need, need another body of water to drink. Uh, but, um, one of the things, one of the things that I was thinking of is, so we we haven't been at all that in, active on our Instagram lately, uh, but our Instagram, our had Instagram, is not exactly you know meant to attract clients in this sort of way, but we were reposting a lot of content from web designers, um, a lot of which went silent, and that is sort of an attestment to if it was bringing them a lot of money, they wouldn't have all went silent, and like a lot of them went silent. Uh, a freakish amount. There's some real successful ones on there, and I'm sure a bunch of the big ones have gotten jobs, of course, or the ones that have gotten their stuff shared on larger pages have gotten certain jobs or certain contacts, absolutely. But it certainly doesn't seem to be as lucrative as it would appear. And this is slightly off topic, but it's a question, I guess. We're always sold this social media marketing stuff, for the most part, by influencers. Is the social media market only for influencers? So those guys are saying, this is the best place to market. Look at all my followers. Look at all my likes. Look at all my retweets. Look at all this. Look at all that. Look at all this. Yeah, but you are an influencer. You are a product of the social media. Are are the social media the only place, like the only place where people like you thrive? And that, you know what I mean? And everybody else, it's just another billboard. 
Like, I, I, I like, wouldn't buy a billboard on a highway and expect $10 billion to come flying in. Mm-hmm. But these influencers but like, are selling it like it's the bee's knees here. Are you saying, are you asking if you have to become an influencer to benefit as much as they're saying? I'm wondering if if, if social media marketing is significantly, and again, this is one survey, so I, I'm just asking the question. I'm wondering whether an influencer is what social media has is built for. And their their marketing absolutely works because they're a social media influencer. They're getting like a but benefit. They have to become, but they have to become a social media influencer. Correct. But the thing is, is you and I, for example, have to worry about how Webflow works, how HTML works, how JS works, how Vue.js works, how all this stuff works. We have to worry about all this stuff. We have to worry about our taxes right now. We have to worry about this, that, this, that, this, that. These influencers are running around and depending on their content, they're for the most part wondering, hmm, how does the how does the Instagram algorithm work? How does the Twitter algorithm work? How does the Facebook algorithm work? That's all they do. And then they make content to go for that. We would have to do their job, their job on the daily of experimenting, playing with, and whatever with the algorithms and adapting with the algorithms and then generating content all while doing our job and using that no, those pieces of social media content that we create to push business to our web agency. Like it maybe Yeah, it would be tough. You know what I mean? Like it now this is why you probably hire somebody, but it's just something to, it's yeah. something I've kind of picked up on here, I think. Yeah, I think there I think there is a trend of that. Like you have to put in a lot more work than we think. Like posting every day consistently isn't enough anymore. The, posting good content is hard. You have to make consistently, it consistently. Yeah, consistently isn't enough anymore either. It's more not only you're posting good content and high quality content, but you're posting the right content at the right time, at the right place, with the right background, the right hashtags, the, right hashtags, and the amounts of hashtags, and yeah, yeah, at the, and and get lucky. Like you have a one percent chance of it getting viral, etc. Like. There's a lot more variables than just being like be good at it, be consistent, and go like you know, whatever. There's a reason why I there's think... SEO agencies. <clears throat> yeah, and even they can't guarantee you anything. Not at all. Yeah. So yeah, that, I mean, I think that that covers that pretty well. Um, so I think last last little bit here, last little question. And that is consumers' web browsing habits. So not only did this company talk to web designers, they actually talked to a lot of consumers as well to figure out where they're browsing websites, like where they're getting their content from. And to, I think, a lot of people's surprise and my hesitation to believe they asked enough people. Yeah, I'm a little bit little be, speculate, speculatory on this yeah, one. I'm spe- uh, yeah, is... Desktop one at seventy one percent, mobiles at twenty four, and tablets at five. Now, just based on the statistics that I'm seeing across most of the websites that we manage, Matt, it's it's fifty fifty this, at least, at least, and most of the time it's way more for mobile. And like, and, I, and I'm like tossing one, tablet into mobile too. Like I'm saying fifty fifty. Yeah, like the the one that the one that I'm monitoring right now, uh, pretty heavily is i think 77 mobile and then the rest is oh yeah tablet and desktop if, and if that's, it was that's if it was like 80 percent, yeah like 70 to 80 percent mobile like is down. not a shock like when i look at it it's like oh okay yeah. so i'm i'm more shocked by the fact that they're saying that 71 percent browse desktop now now benefit of the doubt if you were asked how you browse your content or how you prefer to browse your content what would you say D- desktop poll. definitely so maybe that's what's happening is like people are browsing more on mobile because it's out of necessity like they're just around more their mobile devices are around more often than their it's desktops in their or their laptops it's literally right there it's in their pocket but their preference and what they would say in a in a you know an answer is they want they would rather do it on their desktop this is also a web design like support survey or web design uh, survey not support survey just a web design survey and what i'm wondering is is whether the question was maybe not framed by the askers, by the people doing the survey, but framed by the people that like took the question as like what you're saying, like, oh, like I prefer I, I prefer the desktop, but also in a more official sense where 
these people, which are consumers in their own right, may be business owners. And so it's very possible that they're thinking like, oh, well, I'm always on my computer at, at my office. I'm always at my computer at, at my home office or whatever. Because there are things that people will still leave to. I'll be like, ah, it's going to be more convenient to do on my computer. And I'll just leave it. And you do not realize often how off, how much and how often you use your phone. That might be a big thing too. There's a lot of those like digital well-being apps that are being baked into things. Like I know my Note 10 has a digital well-being thing. I know that uh, iPhones uh, have or ha- have or will have. I think they already have it. They have it. They um, have, they have yeah. like I think a, all Android phones after Android 9. Have okay, it. so they have like a digital well-being thing that track your, oh, you were on Facebook for this much time. Your screen was on this time for the, this this long. This is how long, how many times you unlock the device, et cetera, et cetera. So I think maybe people are underestimating the amount of time that they pull out their phone. How many, the amount of times that they pull out their phone and the amount of times. Because if you quickly go and read something, I don't ever think of it as being a website. So it could be yeah. that, like the actual statistics, like on Google Analytics or whatever you're using, don't lie. But the people aren't necessarily lying. They manage to not be paying attention. They remember sitting at their desktop for a long period, but they don't necessarily remember they were at the bus stop and checked the weather on the weather network, like on the weather network site. I think the takeaway, the main takeaway from this is that responsive design, just, you know, build fit for 50-50. Assume 50-50 and build for 50-50. Yeah, there's like... There's like the the idea that you should be building mobile first and that, and I still don't subscribe to that. I think the desktop has the most amount of space, and personally, I think that's where you should start. But that also doesn't mean that I'm sacrificing the mobile experience. I think that you should be able to do everything, or most, if not everything, and hopefully everything, that you can do on desktop on the mobile version. And I think that a lot of the designs that we used to do in the past when we were first getting started, we would hide a lot of stuff on mobile, like, oh, this picture looks bad, let's change it. Lately, it's been, no, let's change the change the content such that it's still delivered to the to the mobile in the best way possible change the aspect ratio of the photo make it put it into a light box that's easily accessible for people on mobile etc etc those type of things i would say that those are the type of things that we do now to and to ensure that the mobile experience is as good as it could be with that amount of screen real estate and you can do everything you can do or most of everything you can do on the desktop version and the mobile versions together i would say that that's the number one thing for us i don't necessarily agree with kicking somebody out because that office like there's a lot of offices out there and there's sometimes like lax rules like relaxed rules on what people browse on and if you're listening to podcasts you might just be like oh, i'll just pull it up on my work computer and you might browse your podcast on there or you might even have a youtube youtube up or something while you're you know entering numbers in or whatever you're doing for your job and that's a lot of desktop usage and it's not to me it's not fair to count those people out and to and just to be blunt having the extra screen real estate like 90 percent of the time is better if not more than 90 percent of the time it is just a better experience and i think that this kind of this proves it yeah <clears throat> that people that prefer it like even the, even though they're using the phone a lot more but they prefer the desktop it, it's better to build with a, the mindset of like build good experiences for both because even though people might use the phone more often, when they go on their website on your on the desktop, they're maybe experiencing it and, and enjoying it more, and that could be a more lasting impression for your website and a more re- like a higher reason for a person to come back than just a quick view on a cell phone. I don't know. It, it, my takeaway, you know, treat it fifty fifty. It's an interesting statistic because we don't see that in the analytics. Good, we talked about it. I think all these statistics have been kind of cool. Like, it's nice to see actual numbers associated with our thoughts, because a lot of it has kind of backed up our, our thoughts. Like, oh, yeah. there hasn't been too many shocks, you know what I mean? Um, which is good. It mean, means that we're not crazy. Uh, we're not doing anything too out of the out of the realm of the field anyway. Yeah, and I think it's important to kind of go through and give our own take on them as well. And we'd love to hear your take, obviously. Any, any of these, you know, do any of these surprise you? Anything like that? Like, get... You know, add us at HTML everything on Twitter and HTML all the things on Instagram. Let us know what you think. Um, I think that's that's about it. Good episode, in my opinion. Good good discussion. Other than the fact that my throat kind of gave out there in the middle. Yeah, you drank like two liters of water there, bud. Holy crap. Yeah, I had to like yeah, all my water's gone. All my water bottle, everything. Yeah, yeah like a water bottle, a water, a water <laughs> yeah, yeah. like bottle, like a permanent one, like a plastic one that you refill, and then you had a wa- a glass of water. 
It's yep. ridiculous. And it's, and it's coming back now, so we gotta we gotta end it. We gotta end this before yeah. more hacking of the. Okay, so I'll we'll postpone the web news for next week. Uh, the web news is going to be why. Just gonna tell you the the title: why the different departments in an office hate each other. It's or like that's the question. That's the area. I'm not gonna get into it. I kind of want it to be a little bit of a little bit of mystique there. Um, also. If you want to join our newsletter, I know I mentioned that earlier, um, I'm just going to put a link to it in our show notes on the HTML All The Things website uh, because it's a MailChimp link that has a random string in it, so I'm just not going to read that out. Um, but yeah, so we, we're planning on sending out, I haven't done it yet because we ran into a snag and now we solved the snag, but now I'm doing taxes and uh, panicking, So uh, as you've heard in the episode. So, uh, so basically... We're going to be sending out weekly newsletters. This, this, our plan currently, currently, is to do a weekly newsletter that complements the episode. But we're also going to do a reading, a reading list. So Mike and I are going to choose a few articles every single uh, week that you know we enjoyed reading, and we're going to send it out. Um, some of mine and like or both, some of ours, excuse me, aren't necessarily all going to be web dev, web design. Some of mine are server admin because I'm interested in that type of stuff. Uh, some of Mike's might be off topic as well, um, but all of his in the one art in the one collection that we have so far are all web uh, dev stuff. So yeah, so come, come check that out. Also, if you want to uh, read the article from today's episode, the uh, one from SiteJet, I'll be including that, of course, in our show notes as well. Uh, but thank you for listening. And make sure you don't miss an episode by subscribing on the platform of your choice. You can follow us on the socials via at HTML, all the things. That's on Facebook and Instagram. You can also follow us on Twitter. That's at HTML everything. We're on Medium and we're on GitHub. And remember also on Patreon, that's patreon.com slash HTML, all the things. Check out the tiers and give that a go. And many thanks to our $3 tier patron, Sean from RabbitWorks JavaScript. Find him at youtube.com slash RabbitWorks JavaScript. Garrick from Local Path Computing and Web Design. Find him at localpathcomputing.com. Craig, a.k.a. Cosworth. Ryan Gantrell from Blue Black Digital. Find him at blueblackdigital.com. Chris from, from Self Made Web Designer. You can find him at selfmadewebdesigner.com. Tim from The Web Hacker. Find him at thewebhacker.com. And DL Ford from dlford.io. Feel free to leave a comment or a review on the platform that you're listening to this on. And we are signing off.